Good day. As is traditional, I'm going to start with a brief rundown of military developments in Ukraine, uh, which, however, are now taking an increasingly clear-cut character. And I've noticed that even the British media, which is consistently the most fervently pro-Ukrainian in its discussions of the events on the battlefields, is now starting to express growing doubts about the direction of events in the fighting. Briefly, the Ukrainian forces in the Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, uh, um, conurbation now look like they're almost entirely cut off. There's talk about the fact that the Russians, the Russian artillery, is now able to cover the last road network, the last paved road that leads into these two towns, and which is the last uh, communications point between the Ukrainian forces in Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, and Ukrainian forces further west. The extent to which the Ukrainians have been able to keep their troops in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk supplied at all via this road is problematic anyway. anyway. Anybody who knows logistics, anyone who knows anything at all about logistics, knows that you can't keep 20,000 troops, the alleged size of the force, in Severodonetsk or Lysychansk. Maybe that's an over-exaggeration, but anyway, tens of thousands of troops. You cannot keep them supplied via one single road, especially not if it comes under artillery fire. But of course, if that road is finally cut, <clears throat> if Russian troops actually are able to occupy or occupy part of it, um, apparently they're just three kilometers away from doing so, then the psychological effect on the defenders in Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, will be substantial. And apparently the other important town that is now very much uh, a target for Russian, um, the Russian offensive is a place called Bakhmut. I've said many times I'm not a great um, expert or planner about military tactics, but it seems that it too is now an important communications node and that if it too falls or is encircled by the Russians, then there will be more problems for the Ukrainian forces in northern Donbass. I, by the way, also noticed that the British media isn't reporting any longer about the situation north of Kharkov. There were lots of claims about a week ago about how Ukraine had supposedly won the Battle of Kharkov. These have simply disappeared from commentary. There's no further advances by the Ukrainians towards the Russian border. In fact, the Ukrainian forces there are being pushed back from the Russian border. And though I'm not certain that the Russians are really interested in advancing for the time being all the way to Kharkov, well, presumably they could do so if they were motivated enough to do it. Meanwhile, across the rest of Ukraine, the situation is becoming economically extremely difficult. Ukraine's harvest this year, this is an important topic because there's much discussion about Ukraine's importance in the general food situation. Ukraine's harvest has fallen or is likely to fall by about half as compared with the situation last year. There are continued Russian missile strikes against the transportation network and the fuel crisis is getting worse apparently across Ukraine and is now starting to affect the military as well. There's also reports that the Russians identified a large ammunition dump in a town in central Ukraine called Zhitomir which they attacked and this particular ammunition this particular depot or dump apparently was where an awful lot of the Western weapons, the Russians haven't said which weapons, anyway, a lot of these Western weapons were supposedly stored. So, a deteriorating military picture in Ukraine, and this is starting to become recognised, as I said, even in the British media. The key event which has caused this sudden shift 
in the coverage of the war, at least in Britain, is not, in my opinion, the events in northern Donbass, uh, critical though they are. It is the mass surrender of Ukrainian troops in the Azov-style steelworks. And you may remember that yesterday I said that there was one particular Ukrainian commander, Commander Kalina, who appeared to have been taken captive, though shortly after videos started to appear of him allegedly in the Azov-style steelworks, continuing to send out defiant messages to the world. I suggested that at least one of those videos um, appeared to have been made earlier and might not have been made on the day when it was published. And it turns out that that is correct. Kalina is indeed a prisoner. It seems all of the commanders of the Azov style uh, uh, unit, the, the Azov regiment and of the Marine Force that were um, that were located within the Azov style steelwork, all three of the top commanders have now been captured. And the Russians, in fact, have issued, have published a um, film of a, sh a small part of the interrogation of one of these commanders. I think it is, in fact, Commander Kalina. By the way, I understand these are not the actual names of these people. Um, uh, Volin, Volina is apparently, actually, his correct name is Volinsky. I'm not quite sure why they have all come up with these rather um, curious names, uh, um, but there we go. The Russians, by the way, claim that the overall commander of the Azov unit, now I'm not sure whether this is the entire Azov regiment or just the part of the Azov regiment, that had been surrounded in the Azov, Azov style factory, that this particular commander had to be removed from the AT factory in an armored car because there were dangers to him from some angry members of the civilian population. Of course, that may be true. It might also, of course, be that the Russians did that in order to give the impression that this man was generally hated by the population in Mariupol. I haven't actually seen much signs so far of the civilian population in any part of Ukraine taking any particular measures into their own hands, whether against um, Azov or Ukrainian political activists and militants, or indeed against Russian soldiers. The civilian population seems to have made a decision, a wise decision, to hold back from any active participation in the fighting. Though you do get lots of people, especially in the Donbass, who do express their feelings. And in the Donbass, they tend to be feelings which are very critical of the Ukrainian government. Um, anyway, you get, you get lots of people like that who express their views in pretty strong terms. But I've not yet seen any sign of anybody, any civilian, trying to take, if you like, the law into their own hands of carrying out lynchings or anything of that sort. And by the way, I sincerely hope it, it remains so. Anyway, the entire force in the Azov style steelworks has now, um, has now surrendered. The Russians confirmed that they're now in full control. Um, apparently, reconnaissance uh, units and sappers will be sent into the Azov style steelworks to remove any explosive devices or any any booby traps left still in these bunker in this bunker complex there's also of course concern to find the dead bodies that are supposed to be there as well we've heard a lot about those from the Ukrainian side but and you know presumably there are some people who are indeed buried or uh, uh, um kept somewhere in these bunkers and no doubt once these reconnaissance units and um, sappers have done their work and perhaps by the way caught up with any ukrainian stragglers who might still be hiding there no doubt teams of investigators russian investigators will be going through the azov style bunkers 
to find whatever secrets are still left there. No doubt the Ukrainian soldiers will have destroyed any thing that they can destroy which would be incriminating or embarrassing but um, even if they were to do that it's still likely that investigators carrying out forensic investigations would be able to find out quite a lot from what was remaining there. Having said that I think it's now a reasonable point to say that many of the speculations about what was there in the as of style steelworks many of those speculations have now been shown to be untrue there are no high-ranking nato military officials in the as of style steelworks there were none um, certainly no generals certainly no retired generals um, all those rumors that were circulating have turned out to be wrong there's no evidence of any large number of French Foreign Legion troops in the Azovstal steelworks. Um, undoubtedly, some Western soldiers, Westerners were there, but they seem to have been, as I've said, people who had enlisted either in the Azov regiment or some, some of them possibly, uh, though I think this is less likely, in the regular Ukrainian army. But certainly, we're not looking at a Western presence in the Azov steelworks. There's little evidence so far of any secret laboratories there. I was always skeptical about that story. There's nothing yet that suggests or implies that anything like that existed. And I've always been, as I said, dubious about this. And frankly, I think we, we will find once these reconnaissance units and investigators have done their work, that there's little evidence of that sort of thing. That doesn't mean that the bunkers under the Azov steelworks, the Azov style steelworks don't hold their secrets, but we'll have to wait and see what they are. There might be some rather grisly secrets there, but they're of a kind, I think, that are probably commonplace in these kind of conflicts. That still leaves open one of the great mysteries of this war. And that was the desperate attempts of Ukraine to evacuate people from the Azovstal steelworks. All those helicopters that were sent in to take people out, all those ships that were sent to take people out, President Zelensky, by the way, has now for the first time commented about this. He's admitted that Ukraine lost many pilots as a result of these attempts. He's also admitted that this was that, that all of these attempts were uh, unsuccessful because there was no real prospect of getting through because the Russian air defences were so um, effective in and around the steelworks that begs the question it really does beg the question of why all those helicopters why all those ships were sacrificed to no purpose that i can see um in order to ev carry out an evacuation which was frankly logistically hopeless well the only explanations that i can think of are two firstly this had to be done in order to keep the troops in the Azovstal steelworks motivated by giving them the false idea that help was on its way and that it had not been and that they had not been abandoned i have to say i find that if that is so utterly cynical it's a case of throwing away the lives of some men in order to keep others fighting in a hopeless cause as i said i find that beyond cynical the other possibility and i think this is actually the more plausible one is that some of these commanders in the steelworks the act people like valina and kalina and all those um had considerable influence within the um political system in kiev they had particular pull and that this was enabling and that they were using this they were, they had this kind of leverage which obliged zelensky 
to send all these helicopters and all those ships to um, Mariupol, where, of course, they were all destroyed and many brave men, as a result, lost their lives. So that's, I think, where we are in military terms, a disastrous defeat for Ukraine in uh, Mariupol. It's been pointed out, by the way, by several people that this is the biggest haul of prisoners that has been taken by any side in the Ukrainian conflict, which of course began in 2014. It, the number, the haul of prisoners that has been taken by the Russians and their allies in Mariupol inclu inc um, exceeds the numbers of prisoners, Ukrainian prisoners, taken by the Russians and their allies or at least by the Donbass militia, in 2014 and 2015, in Ilovaisk, the Battle of Ilovaisk, and the battles of Debalseva, by far more Ukrainian prisoners have been taken in Mariupol than were taken in Ilovaisk and Debalseva combined. And by the way, we now have a good, accurate number for the number of Ukrainian troops in the Azov-style steelworks, the Russians say that the total number of prisoners is just over 2,400. Um, presumably, some of them were killed in the fighting, but it's um, clear that the highest number of 4,000 was way off, but so were the lower numbers of around 1,000 that others had speculated about. So an entire unit of the Ukrainian army has now been destroyed. All its leaders have been taken prisoner in an unconditional surrender. And we also, all of this coming on top of the progressive collapse of Ukrainian forces in northern Donbass. Now, there are reports that Ukraine is now trying to set up a second line of defence west of Donbass. Um, a new line running from Kharkiv through um, Poltava, Dnipropetrovsk, Zaporozhye, and Nikolaev. Well, whether there is the time to set up this new defence line, which, by the way, looks to me incredibly long, um, whether there's the time to do that, whether there's the troops and material to protect it, whether the Russians even have plans to move further west, well, that's something we will have to wait and see. Meanwhile, even as the military situation turns dismal, President Biden has now signed off on his $40 billion aid package. Now, I'm going to, for aid package for Ukraine. Now, I'm going to go through this in more detail now that we've got the bill uh, passed. I will say that at the moment it resembles very much the kind of military aid program that the United States previously gave to, gave to Afghanistan and to South Vietnam. And one thing immediately stood out for me, which is that the United States is now taking over payment of salaries of uh, Ukrainian civil servants. The same thing happened in Afghanistan. It was profoundly demoralizing, it, uh, um, and it perhaps illustrates a further point, which is that Ukraine's real economy, its actual economy, is now hurtling towards collapse. What is keeping Ukraine together, what is holding it together, is this flood of money from the United States. Now, whether these vast sums of money from the United States are going to be anywhere close to being enough to making up for the internal collapse of Ukraine's own economy, that is another matter. The Ukrainians can continue to spend money from their budget, from Western aid, but the danger in this is that if at any point in time that aid is interrupted, as we saw in Afghanistan, as we saw previously back in the 70s with South Vietnam, at that point, the whole house of cards collapses. And that, it seems to me, 
is very close to where we're getting with Ukraine now. And of course, vast sums of budgetary spending, um, most of which will go to the wall, um, don't provide people in Ukraine with jobs. They don't provide them with livelihoods. The reason that all this money has to be poured into Ukraine to keep the currency operating, to keep the salaries paid, is precisely because those jobs are starting to disappear, those factories are starting to close, the supply chains are disappearing, and of course that means that no taxes are being paid, tax revenue is starting to fall, and that's why the United States is having to make up with financial aid directly to the Ukrainian government. So we get a vicious circle. We get a vicious circle in which the real economy starts to implode, creating greater, ever greater economic immiseration, whilst at the same time, the government keeps functioning after a fashion purely on the basis of foreign aid. This is not a good situation. There's been repeated examples of this happening, as I said, in recent years. They happened in Afghanistan. They happened in South Vietnam. And sooner or later, this whole thing, if it can, goes on for too long, will come crashing down like a house of cards. Well, perhaps, just possibly, the first doubts are starting to appear not just in Europe, where it's now clear that the, the political class in some European countries is now beginning to have serious doubts about the war. In Italy, Mario Draghi, the Prime Minister, went and spoke to President Biden of the United States about 10 days ago, try, pleading with President Biden to embark upon a diplomatic solution. Matteo Salvini, the de facto leader of the Italian right has now been talking about the same thing. Silvio Berlusconi, the former Italian prime minister, who's still a political force in, um, in Italy, has now come out publicly and said that Ukraine needs to negotiate with Russia and accept Russia's terms. So Italy looks like the first signs there that it may be starting to buckle. There's problems in Smaller states, Bulgaria, Greece, Croatia, I'm not going to discuss those. But the big one always is the United States. And the key point is that 57 Republican Congress people, representatives, voted against this uh, $40 billion aid package. They're all members of the Trump wing of the party. But obviously, opposition is starting to grow. And the same thing was true in the Senate. Now, the Republican leadership of the Senate, the Mitch McConnell wing of the Republican Party, wanted to waive this $40 billion aid package through. The idea was that it would simply pass quickly via consensus, that there would hardly need to be a vote. Um, Rand Paul put a spoke in that particular wheel, he said that there had to be an inspector general to at least supervise how this money was spent. So that forced a vote. And the result of that vote is that 11 senators, all, of, all Republicans, but all again from the Trump wing of the party, all of them came out and opposed this bill and voted against this bill. So we're starting to see opposition from the Republican right crystallize. And I suspect that this is going to grow and it's being received with growing alarm, I suspect, in more and more places. And it seems to me that this is also now starting to have uh, create doubts amongst other people in the United States as well. So we've now had a very, very interesting editorial, or at least an article, by the New York Times editorial team. Now, the New York Times is, of course, a fervidly pro-Democrat 
newspaper in the United States. It has at times been used by officials in democratic administrations. It was very common for this to happen during Obama's time, but it was sometimes used by officials in democratic administrations um, as a place to express opinions about policies. And we've had, a, as I said, this very interesting article. It's not exactly, as I think, an editorial comment, but it was one written by the um, editorial team at the New York Times. And they this article clearly sets out a demand for a shift in policy. The article begins by acknowledging the fact that the consensus supporting the war, supporting Ukraine in the United States, is starting to crack. And it referred to the fact that as, as these Republican representatives and senators in Congress were starting to make statements that were opposing the war. But, uh, well, well, not just statements opposing the war, but that they voted against the $40 billion aid package. But now we see what the New York Times, its editorial team said. And very interestingly, they seemed to call for a compromise, for a compromise, for a negotiated peace with Ukraine making the big concessions. And these are some of the things that this New York Times editorial said. It says, it says, it says the following. Recent bellicose statements from Washington, President Biden's assertion that Mr. Putin cannot remain in power, Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin's comment that Russia must be weakened, and the pledge by the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi that the United States would support Ukraine until victory is won, may be rousing proclamations of support, but they do not bring negotiations any closer. In the end... It is Ukrainians who must make the hard decisions. They are the ones fighting, dying and losing their homes to Russian aggression. And it is they who must decide what an end to the war might look like. If the conflict does lead to real negotiations, it will be Ukrainian leaders who will have to make the painful territorial de decisions that any compromise will demand. Now, that isn't exactly a call for Ukraine to make, to decide for nego to negotiate and to make painful territorial decisions, which are what a compromise would require. It's not quite that, but essentially that's what it says. It says that Ukraine needs to sit down and negotiate and accept the surrender of territory, the loss of territory. And then the editorial says elsewhere, as the war continues, Mr. Biden should also make clear to President Zelensky and his people that there is a limit to how far the United States and NATO will go to confront Russia and limits to the arms, money and political support they can muster. It is imperative that the Ukrainian government's decisions be based on a realistic assessment of its means and how much more destruction Ukraine can sustain. Confronting this reality may be peace painful, but it is not appeasement. This is what governments are duty-bound to do, not chase after an illusory win, and the word win is in quotation marks. Russia will be feeling the pain of isolation and debilitating economic sanctions for years to come, and Put Mr. Putin will go down in history as a butcher. The challenge now is to shake off the euphoria, stop the taunting, and focus on defining and completing the mission. 
America's support for Ukraine is a test of its place in the world in the 21st century and Mr. Biden has an opportunity and an obligation to help define what that will be. Now, if one takes out the padding, if one takes out the irrelevances, that looks like a call from the New York Times editorial team to the administration, to President Biden himself, to stop talking about defeating Russia in Ukraine, to recognize that what that is doing is destroying Ukraine, to, to urge the Ukrainians to sit down and to negotiate, and to acknowledge the fact that Ukraine is going to have to make significant territorial concessions. At the very least, it's going to have to accept the loss of Crimea, Donbass, and now Kherson region, and Zaporozhye, most of Zaporozhye. Um, Perhaps the Russians will demand more if the war continues for much longer. It is certain that they will demand more. The point is that that is what the New York Times is essentially saying, that the Ukrainian government, Zelensky's government, should do. And it is also what the New York Times is telling President Biden that he should do. And the New York Times is also telling President Biden and it is also telling Ukraine that there are limits to the amount of military, financial and other types of support that the United States can provide Ukraine. Ukraine US support to Ukraine is not unlimited. The United States may be reaching the point beyond which it cannot go on supporting Ukraine um, uh, further. So quite a strong editorial comment from the New York Times. Now, I wonder whether this reflects dissension within the administration. I wonder whether this also reflects dissension within the Democratic Party. It's always seemed to me, and I'm not you know, an expert on the political intrigues within the Democratic Party. But it does make me wonder whether um, the New York Times, which I've always personally felt is perhaps more closely aligned with Barack Obama and his people in the, in the Democratic Party, whether perhaps the Obama-Kamala Harris wing are starting to get very seriously concerned about where this is where this war is going. They are starting to worry that the old man, the president, is utterly obsessed by this war in Ukraine to the point of almost total exclusion of consideration of all other issues. That the economy in the United States is going into ever deeper stagflationary crisis as a result that there's no real solution to these problems until something is done to end the war and that um, the Democrats look likely to lose badly in the midterm elections in November, which could create all kinds of further problems for the Democrats, especially with all these legal cases now being brought first by the Durham investigation, which is now suing or prosecuting Michael Sussman, this um, um, lawyer who acted for the Clinton campaign during the 2016 election and which had and who had a major role in Russia Gate. And of course, there's also the laptop gate investigation underway as well. So it could it does seem to me as if there's growing alarm on the part of some people in the Democratic Party that things are not going to plan, that things are not turning out as expected that Ukraine is losing the war, that the United States and the West, the West are facing a serious economic crisis and that there is now growing risk, always worrying for Democrats, that the Republicans might win back first Congress and then the White House and use the power that that gives them to carry out a major and sustained attack 
on the Democratic Party exploiting all of these scandals that lie in the past, Russiagate, laptop gate, and all the rest. And that they're now trying to convey to President Biden and to his foreign policy team that this thing has gone as far as it can go and the time has come to look for a negotiated solution and to call a stop. Well, I hope that is true. I will say this, how much better, if that is the what happens now, how much better it would have been if all of this had been done in March, if instead of sabotaging the negotiations that were looking as if they might start to move somewhere following that meeting in Istanbul in late March, that meeting between the Ukrainian and Russian negotiators in Istanbul. How much better if instead of sabotaging the, the emerging the consensus towards a diplomatic track to end the crisis that was starting to crystallize in Istanbul, something which the US government and the British government did, they worked to sabotage those negotiations. How much better if the United States and Britain had instead supported the negotiations in Istanbul instead of sabotaging them? You, thousands of lives would have been spared. Far less damage to Ukraine would have been done. The situation in the world economy might have been less critical and there might have been less signs of dissent spreading across the collective West. Well, as we know, Britain and the United States, Boris Johnson and President Biden, the old man in the White House, took a different course. And to be straightforward about it, for the moment, I don't think that they're prepared to reverse course. This New York Times editorial is an interesting sign the dissent is starting to appear. I don't think that it's yet anywhere near strong enough to force the administration to change course. Anyway, we shall see. But it is interesting that with events in Ukraine, with the situation in the world economy, all of them starting to take a particularly alarming course, alarming, obviously, for the Western powers, we, mu we are starting to see the first serious voices talking for a reverse, for a change of direction, and for a need to negotiate a compromise. Well, thank you for joining me for this programme today. I look forward to you joining me again soon for future programmes on this channel. I um, would ask... In the meantime, that you remember that you can find us on Rumble and Locals. Remember, if you're watching these programs on Rumble, if you go to the t top of the video, you can see a red maroon button that will take you directly to our Locals homepage, where you can join our thriving community on Locals, participate there in my ex the exclusive content that we publish on Locals, including my... Uh, uh, live streams which happen every Wednesday at 1400 hours Eastern Standard Time and which are exclusive to locals. You can also join us, uh, you can also join us on other platforms, on uh, the new free speech platform SuperU, on Odyssey. We've now got a thriving Telegram channel as well. And you can also um, support us via Patreon and Subscribestar. Don't forget to go to our shop, check out our shop. We have amazing things that you can find there. And last but not least, please remember to tick the like button if you've liked this video and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to you joining me again soon and have a wonderful and very good day until then.